Hey, AAP Environmental Science, Mr. Field here. All right, so we're going to kind of go through and continue some of the stuff that we're doing here with Unit 5 on land and water use. All right, so today what we're going to kind of talk about is the Green Revolution and GMOs, our genetically modified organisms. All right, so take some notes. This is what we would have done in class today, um, and it's just going to be quick and simple. All right. So industrial agriculture, this is a phrase that you're going to hear me say a lot And when it comes to food production. All right? There'll be a few things that we do from a food production and a food waste standpoint when we get back from Christmas break. Uh, but when we say industrial agriculture or agribusiness, okay, this is the me mechanization and standardization applied to food production that we see in the United States as well as just globally. All right, these are the massive amount of fields upon fields of very similar crops and using um, heavy machinery to harvest them. Okay. So there's a couple of things that go on here. All right. So farming itself, because of the cost that go into it compared to the amount of food product that gets made is that there's actually an energy subsidy to help offset the cost um, for farmers. All right. So the amount of fossil fuel energy and the human energy input per calorie of food produced. So what we have to look at is look at some things that are going on there. All right. So in the United States, we have a 10 calorie energy input. All right. So we use 10 calories of energy from fossil fuel energy and human energy to grow a single calorie that you consume. All right. So we're working on a major deficit here. All right. So we put in 10 calories worth of energy and we only get out one calorie. All right. So we've got this automatic negative cost when it comes to producing food. So the U.S. government subsidized that. So it's an energy subsidy to help out farmers. OK. And again, this is mostly due to fossil fuel use in a couple of different ways. One, making and using fertilizer, chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Um, fueling tractors and machinery, irrigation, um, and transportation from the field to the processing location. Okay, so with that being said, that's why it costs more for a salad um, than it does a Big Mac because there's less inputs that go into the few ingredients that go on that because of the way things are done with it. All right. So we'll, it, we'll do more of that when we actually get back in class. So there's kind of a hard concept to um, kind of think about. All right. So what the green revolution did was it was a shift to this mechanization and fertilization and irrigation and also really improved the crop varieties over the past hundred years. Okay. It's not green in the sense of being environmentally friendly. It's green in the sense of what it produced as well as the monetary aspect. All right. So mechanization, this is where we start getting into big agribusiness. Okay. So the biggest thing with the green revolution is that we got to talk about economies of scale. So the amount of costs that go into producing our food is really good for international agribusinesses. Okay. Because they can spread out the cost over hundreds of thousands of acres versus what small family farms could do. All right. Just because they can average that cost out and they can move the machinery from one field to another quite easily because they're making it work for over 100,000 acres versus just maybe 100 like a family farm does. OK. And because it's an international business, a lot of times they can justify the large upfront costs that these pieces of equipment are because they have such a large scale production. All right. Small farms, small family owned farms are been going away because of this and they can't really afford that cost. It really drives home that loan economy cycle. All right. So if you think back to the dirt documentary, it talked about the farmers in India and how they were drinking the chemical pesticide to commit suicide, um, which was tragic from a human law standpoint, but they were doing it because they couldn't afford to be farmers anymore because of this loan farming um, industry, because of agribusiness or mechanization. Okay, so this is a graph of just kind of what the size, average size of farm is. So if you look back to the 1900s, the average farm was 
in between 100 and 200. It just depends. It was a fall family owned, small family owned farm. All right. And then we really start to see that change in the 50s and 60s where we just see some kind of exponential growth going on until it plateaued to where it's about 500 acres um, into the late 19. 19- 90s early 2000s and still kind of growing to this day but still saying that part so small family owned farms aren't really a thing all right they've become incorporated and even if it is a family owning it they've probably bought out several other farmers lands so that way they could make it more cost effective by farming a larger area all right and i know this is kind of like where my family falls into it like my small family owned farm is still in that 120 ish acres which is why both my uncle and my grandfather had other jobs okay and farming was just not a hobby but a secondary source of income but they actually worked other jobs and it was the supplement to the income okay um this is looking at average farm size by region so looking at hectares of land so monocropping this is what we talk about when we talk about industrial agriculture anymore is just the miles and miles and miles of a single crop so we're in indiana so we see corn if you go to illinois you see corn if you go to iowa you see corn one of my favorite professors in college always said like you know it's an i state we grow corn that's as simple as that all right obviously we grow some other things like soybeans we also grow some wheat and stuff but monocropping has some benefits okay it's very efficient and productive because if you're making this one tractor combine um, planter plant 500 acres of one crop compared to planting okay we're going to plant 100 acres of this then we're going to switch it to a different seed and we're going to plant another 100 acres of this that's a lot of time all right that you're putting into it all right and it's economical again we'll talk about some other subsidy stuff later on i'm sorry okay drawbacks we do have them and we can see them from a dust ball i better oh sorry um it leads to more soil erosion now there's been a lot of um, farming practices that have improved in the past 30 to 40 years to help reduce this but when it first started happening with the green revolution we had that historical event called the dust bowl all right where because we had hundreds of acres and really it's thousands of acres of single crop fields um, we left so many acres of soil barren and just available to be eroded by both wind and water okay they also monocropping also leads to a higher vulnerability to pests all right so if a pest comes through and has that secret to unlock that one type of food and that's all it is for five states all five states are going to be impacted by that one type of insect all right whereas if each state grows something different then it's going to minimize the kind of the damage all right we can also lose genetic diversity in it and it have different lacks of predators going on. Okay. So this is just kind of looking at um, the way things kind of looked in terms of the amount of varieties of different types of seeds. And this kind of transitions us into the GMO, the genetically modified organism. All right. So our top 10 genetically modified foods, and you'll have an assignment on Thursday because um, with this, we're going to look at one of these. So corn, very common one, soy, cottonseed, papaya, rice, um, canola oil or rapeseed, um, potatoes, tomatoes, lots of dairy products and peas. All right. So those are our top 10 genetically modified foods. Okay. So the thing that a lot of people kind of confuse with this is they kind of think of the Gregor Mendel style selective traits and the selective breeding that we've done with animals to get very much desired traits. We're like, oh, that's a very natural thing. And yes, that is true. Like we've had traditional artificial selection um, that's been practiced for thousands of years. We're like, oh, these things will combine and make this new thing for us. And it's great. All right. We love that. All right. However, what we're really kind of looking at here is something different. Okay. What GMOs are doing is they are using modern science to isolate specific genes from one organism and usually a very different organism and transfer it into the genetic makeup or the genetic code or the DNA, if you will, um, 
of the other one. So this is taking something that would not typically breed or intermix because they are two radically different organisms. Whereas if we're breeding a poodle and a St. Bernard, they're still both dogs. They can produce viable offspring. This is like taking parts of a tomato's genetic code and putting it in with corn. Okay. Things that are not going to cross pollinate. All right. This is what genetically modified organisms means is taking two things that would not produce anything and using some of that genetic code to splice it in. OK, now here's the thing. There's a lot of benefits to genetically modified organisms. OK, it can increase the quantity. It can increase the quality and really drive down costs. OK, we can make things be both pest resistant and drought resistant. So we got to use less water and we can use less chemical pesticides um, to make sure the plants aren't eaten by something. So that's a win, right? Pros and cons to it. All right. So. I'm going to put this picture up on the canvas page so that way you can look at it. Um, but it's really kind of taking a look at the science of GMOs. And I already talked about some of those things, um, but really give this a look because it was really informative. And I wish we were here in person so we could talk about a few more of these things. But I want to keep this video kind of short. OK, so one thing that we can do is that we can add essential nutrients to some of these organisms through genetically modifying it okay so making it better for you so vitamin a enriched golden rice so taking the typical um, white rice and taking segments of um, daffodils all right and putting it in with rice so that way it makes it healthier all right, that's a win. Um, we can also use pharmaceutical compounds, which again, reduces the cost of manufacturing them. All right, so in case like insulin, okay? Again, it reduces expenses, it increases profits, and it drives down the cost of food, okay? It makes it cheaper, all right, to produce. So that means we don't have to spend as much. And that's a big thing at a grocery store. If you would go look at a grocery store and you would go look at something that is GMO free versus the non versus the GMO product, the GMO product is typically going to be cheaper than the non GMO. All right. And it's because of the way it was modified and those things help reduce the cost, those cost inputs that go into it. OK, now here's the thing. There's plenty of concerns out there. Um, a lot of people are very anti-GMO. They just make it sound are very negative with it um, for a lot of reasons. Some of it um, is just hysteria and kind of going with the crowd and thinking, oh, and ha taking that kind of religious component to it. Like, oh, if it wasn't meant to be this way, it can't be healthy. All right. So here's the thing, though. GMOs are pretty safe. In fact, most of the food products that you eat, unless you're specifically buying something that says it's GMO free, chances are it was made with GMO products. All right. Um, and there's very little evidence to show that it isn't healthy for humans to take them. About the only label um, that kind of has kind of uptick with the amount of GMOs that we have in our grocery stores is that we have seen more cases of people with food allergies. Now, we haven't really kind of made that link yet, um, but it does look like maybe because we have so many GMO products, um, we're starting to have more food allergies, or it could just be that we're getting better at diagnosing food allergies too. So there's still kind of that debate, but that seems to be like the one trend um, that they're not safe or unhealthy for human consumption. Okay. The big thing is that we do have impacts on biodiversity and the genetic diversity. So that three pools of diversity that we can have, we're looking at that genetic diversity pool at this point. All right. So that's going way back to unit two. Um, so the thing that we can have is that we can have that cross pollinization where we can have a GMO um, breeding or with a non GMO variety of the same thing, um, which can, again, help minimize the amount of genetic diversity that's out there, but at the same time also potentially pump it up because we could get a new hybrid out of it. Um, but again, some people are concerned that we're going to eliminate natural varieties and we need to create buffer zones between GMO fields and non-GMO fields just so that way they don't um, 
cross pollinate. Um, and there's some people that go out and they try to, the seed bank tries to store um, natural varieties of stuff. They don't do stuff with GMOs because they want to preserve the integrity of the non GMO species. One thing about GMOs is that companies can patent them. Okay, since the 1980s, um, we had this diamond verse, I can't say it, um, U.S. Supreme Court case um, that basically made it said that we could, companies could patent their GMO patents. Um, so their GMO process, they can own the patent to it and nobody can reproduce it in that specific concept. All right. So again, a couple of um, Supreme Court cases going on with that. Um, Bauman versus Monsanto. And again, it's a really big company. It controls, it's 10 of the biggest companies control about 73% of the seeds that farmers use. All right. Looking at a couple of different herbicides that get used. And again, just kind of dropping through and looking at a couple of the major um, industrial markets that and what they control when it comes to pesticide and seed sales. So we see this comparable where they're kind of doing both, where pesticides is blue and the seeds are red. So when you drive around and you see what type of um, seed that they use, we can also usually infer then that they're going to use a pesticide that goes with that seed variety. Okay. Here's the thing. There's a not a lot of regulations when it comes to making sure here in the United States, the things that are GMOs are mandated to label that it's a GMO product. Um, that's here in the United States. In Europe, it's a different story. Um, the European Union actually bans a lot of GMOs. In fact, if you go and look at a grocery store in Europe, so Germany, France, and products that are very similar are different because they are not allowed to use certain ingredients that we use here in the United States. Um, the biggest one that I know of um, is that Mountain Dew's banned in Europe, in the European Union, because of some of the chemicals that are used um, in it. Um, whereas in the United States, it's one of the most popular drinks. Um, organic food, the thing with organic food is that it's just that it's organic. This means it already is a non-GMO variety. So if you eat an organic based diet, you're not taking in any GMOs. All right. Um, but again, labeling can really confuse those that are uninformed. Um, it, when they see that it comes with this sticker that's saying, hey, this is a GMO product, it kind of confuses people and say like, okay, well, is there something wrong with a GMO? Is that why it has to be labeled that it's GMO? Um, if it says it's GMO free, well, okay, why is it GMO free? Is GMO is bad? Again, it kind of puts this negative stigma in there, but a lot of times our GMOs are just really doing a couple things. Again, driving the cost down, making it more pest and drought resistant, a lot of times making it more colorful and even sweeter because one thing um, in the United States is that we want stuff to be sweeter than what it naturally would occur. All right, so GMOs, they're not really that bad, but the way things get labeled with it really kind of helps muddle the water on it, all right? I know this was a longer one, uh, but make sure you took notes with it. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to ask me. Um, again, on Thursday, you're gonna have some stuff with GMOs. Um, other than that, stay healthy, stay safe. See you guys after break, bye.